back to WCB Jazz Vinyl. Today, I'm gonna to give you a preview of the Jazz and Jazz Adjacent 2024 Record Store Day titles. Um, these videos sometimes bring in more folks to my channel than typically watch, gotta be honest. Uh, so let me just say welcome. Similar to the topic of this video, my channel focuses exclusively on Jazz Vinyl in terms of new releases, original pressings, and some of the sort of collecting element. Please do consider subscribing if you want more of this content. You can also follow me on Instagram at what underscore can underscore brown. So what we're going to do today is go title by title, and there are 28 of them slated for Record Store Day this year. Um, I'm going to tell you what the title is, show you what it looks like, give you some detail in terms of either the lineup or the pressing details, depending on what we have available. And for the first time, I'm going to assign low, medium, or high ratings in three categories for each of the titles. So those three categories are audience. So how many people will even be aware of or even like looking for this type of title? Um, uh, so the limited, in terms of how limited is the, uh, is the release? Is it highly limited, meaning there's low quantities, or is it not very limited, meaning there's high quantities? And then the third one is desirability. Is there pent up demand or do we even need this type of title? Is this even worthwhile for Record Store Day? So what I'm gonna do is rate uh, each title according to each of these three categories. And then at the end, what we're gonna do is see how they stack up in terms of uh, us being able to predict maybe which are gonna be the more difficult titles to actually get. Now, what we don't typically know at this point is price, and that obviously plays a role, um, but we're gonna have to, uh, to sort of set that aside because we don't know what it's gonna be. Um, so anyway, let's, let's just see how it goes. So without further ado, um, let's uh, start with the first title. All right, so the first one, Cannonball Adderley's Burnin' in Bordeaux, live in France, 1969. This is being put out by Elemental Music. They often have a bunch of titles for Record Store Day, and this year is no exception. Um, this, let's see, the format of this is gonna be a double LP. It's in a quantity of 2,950, apparently. Um, as the, uh, the title suggests, it was a 1969 recording, and the lineup includes, well, Cannonball Adderley, his brother Nat Adderley, Joe Zawinall, Victor Gaskin, and Roy McCurdy. So in terms of the sourcing for this, they trans it's transferred from the original tape reels. Now, whenever you hear tape reels, what it means is, I believe, like think like reel to reel rather than original master tapes, because they weren't, uh, they didn't necessarily have robust recording techniques at a lot of live sessions, and so they're going to say it's transferred from the original tape reels. For me, that's a little bit of marketing jargon. I think we can expect that this is not going to sound like a studio recording because it's not. Um, but in any event, um, you know, Elemental does the best that they can, and they do typically do a good job, at least in terms of the recordings. I have less love, honestly, for the past. Packaging. So I'm a little bit skeptical on this one, um, despite the fact that uh, you know that it's a, that it's a great label. It's 180 gram, like I said, double LP. So I guess the summary on this thing: I think that the audience for this type of recording is quite high. People love Cannonball Adderley. People love elemental music, and I think a lot of people are going to be paying attention to this particular title. Um, in terms of whether it's a limited release, I'm going to say it's kind of in, in the medium range, and in fact, typically like 2,000 to 3,000 pressing quantity is uh, is kind of the medium range for me. And desirability, I think it's I think it's going to be high. I mean, I, you know, I know I know I said people love Cannonball and people love Elemental, but I think there is pent up demand for this type of recording. 1969 is a pretty great year because it kind of bridges styles for Cannonball. A little bit, and um, and yeah, it's a great uh, it's a great lineup. So that's that's where I stand with uh, with Burnin in Bordeaux. All right, so next up is more Cannonball and more alliteration. So instead of Burnin in Bordeaux, we have Poppin in Paris. Um, live in L'Olympia, 1972. So this is also Elemental Music, also double LP, also a quantity of 2,950. So instead of 1969, well, it's 1972, and here we have Cannonball alongside his brother again, Nat. We also have George Duke, Walter Booker, and Roy McCurdy. So this is also from the original tape reels, right? Not master tapes, but original tape reels. Uh, 180 gram as well. This is going to be, you know, just kind of like a similar type of thing as uh, is born in Burnin in Bordeaux. And here's the thing: 
Because there's so many people out there who collect Elemental and who are looking for their releases on Record Store Day, I personally think that somebody who is looking for that first one is also gonna want to pick up the second one. And so what you're gonna see on Record Store Day is a lot of people carrying both to the extent that they're still available. Um, so it's it's one of those things that like sort of the tag along uh, purchase just makes sense to a lot of people because they record collectors are inherently completists, right? Um, so I, I think very similar uh, sort of ratings on this one. Audience high, I think a lot of people are gonna be looking for this. Um, you know, in terms of whether it's limited or not, again, medium, because it's the same pressing quantity and desirability, yes, it's gonna be quite high because people who get one are gonna want the other. Elemental's collectible for some reason. Um, and uh, I say for some reason, I've never really been a fan of, um, what is it, like some of their Bill Evans titles, just because I think that the replayability is not necessarily there for me. Um, will I be personally interested in some of these, even though that doesn't really go into necessarily what I'm considering desirable? I don't, I don't really know, probably not for me, honestly, um, but, but I still think that there's gonna be a lot of folks who are, uh, who are gonna get excited about it. All right, so here's one that I don't actually know that much about. This is the Monty Alexander Trio live at the Montreux Festival. This is being put out by MPS, and it's in a pretty low quantity of just 1,000. They're actually putting it out on mint green vinyl. Um, and in terms of the recording, well, let's see. So it's the Montreux Festival from 1976. The bassist is John Clayton, and the drummer is Jeff Hamilton. I'm honestly, you know, like I said, I'm just not that familiar uh, with, with Monty Alexander. I've never really listened to that much of his stuff, and I've never really gotten that excited about it either, I have to be honest. I think that there's not going to be many people who are going to be looking for a Monty Alexander uh, recording, and so I'm going to say that the uh, sort of the audience rating is low on this. Um, whether this is scarce, that's a high because a quantity of a thousand. I mean, that's like <laughs> that's barely anything. Um, but unfortunately, I'm going to say desirability is low, and so what we're going to see at the end, I'm sure, in terms of comparing some of these ratings, is that even though there's only one thousand that audience and uh, desirability ratings are gonna kind of drag it down and it probably will still be available for those folks who are interested in finding it. All right, so what's a record store day without a Chet Baker release? So this next one is Chet Baker with Jack Sheldon, both jazz trumpeters, and the title is In Perfect Harmony, The Lost Album. Those of you who follow my channel know that I have a bone to pick with any label who references Lost as part of the kind of marketing for their album, just because I think it's it's overused, it means nothing. Um, and so I, I just think it's a little ridiculous. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, label for this one is Jazz Detective. And, um, and they kind of have that reputation, right, for like these, you know, for discovering, you know, albums and, and things like that, which, which again, I think is a lot of marketing. So this is being put out in a pretty low quantity of 1500. And what this album is, is an unreleased studio album. So it's not live. And this is a 1972 recording with David Frischberg, Joe Mondragon, Nick Creel, and Jack Marshall. Um, so it's being co-produced by Zev Feldman, who uh, that's, you know, the, the guy behind Jazz Detective, as well as Frank Marshall. And it's mastered by Matthew Luttons, I believe is his name, from the original Master Reels. Um, so I don't know exactly where, you know, in, in what format this was sort of discovered, but it sounds like maybe not the master tapes, but maybe a sort of reel-to-reel -reel recording or something like that from, uh, from the master tapes. And it's being ma uh, manufactured at Memphis Record Pressing. Uh, and on 180 gram vinyl. So in terms of my ratings, I think that the audience for this type of release is gonna be high because a lot of people are aware of Chet Baker and there's some crossover appeal, right? So not just your traditional jazz audience, but a lot of other people are gonna see Chet Baker and they're gonna be like, I want that. Now, here's the thing. I don't actually know whether Chet Baker sings on that and I also don't know whether that's gonna impact somebody's um, you know, non-jazz folks' interest in, in even grabbing this because I think a lot of people uh, who aren't necessarily interested in jazz or more after Chet Baker for his voice, as maybe strange as that is to some folks. So in any event, I still think it's gonna be, I still think there's gonna be a lot of people looking uh, for it. In terms of uh, its limited nature, its scarcity, that's gonna be high as well, because a quantity of just 1,500, and its desirability, do we even need this? I'm gonna say medium, um, just because I don't really know that the early 70s was the best period for Chet Baker. Um, I don't know to what extent like, you know, why was this why was this album originally shelved and who originally recorded it and like all of these kind of details. I don't know that we necessarily need this, but again, you know, it, it kind of is what it is and, and I bet it I bet it's still gonna uh, sell pretty well. 
And next up, we have Brother Jack McDuff, and the title is Ain't No Sunshine. So this is being put out by the Real to Real label. It's a double LP in a quantity of 1,500. This is a previously unissued concert recording, and the lineup includes Leo Johnson, Dave Young, Vinnie Corral, uh, Ron, and Ron Davis. Um, so in terms of uh, in terms of the actual sort of physical release, like what is it? So this is going to be uh, so it's a, like I said, it's a double LP. It's going to be hand numbered. Um, let's see, transferred from the original tape reels and pressed on a hundred and eighty gram vinyl. Now, perhaps quite interestingly, the mastering is being done by Kevin Gray at Coherent Audio. So Kevin Gray is a very recognizable figure and has been doing. Um, a lot of great work for a lot of jazz releases, and so people are going to take notice to that. Um, in terms of the, you know, what's the audience like for this type of thing? Um, I'm going to actually say, I'm going to suggest that it's going to be low. I don't know about the audience for a live Jack McDuff session. He hasn't had very many reissues. In fact, I can't think of trying to think of any reissues recently that have been done. A lot of his catalog has kind of been left and I think uh, left alone. And I think a lot of the reason is well, because he's an organ player and organ is still not really fully coming back. I know that, um, I know that, that some folks like Johnny Hammond Smith and, and others are starting to get a little bit more attention, but, but Jack McDuff isn't quite there yet. So I'm, I'm going to stick with low on this one. In terms of its limited nature, I'm going to say high because it's only 1500. And in terms of desirability, and this kind of is like oddly goes against my rating for audience, I think I'm, I'm going to say medium. And I think that the reason is because it's a cool cover. Um, I think, and, I, and that plays a role in, in people's desire. And I think Kevin Gray, I think people are going to take a lot of extra notice to this because Kevin Gray is behind the, uh, the mastering. And, and I don't, um, I don't mean to disparage Jack McDuff and even suggesting that like, you know, Kevin Gray's presence is more important than the fact that, that it's Jack McDuff's session. It's just that, it's just that I, I just don't think that, that Jack McDuff is uh, as popular as, uh, as he certainly was. And I think he has yet to have his resurgence. So that's, that's kind of what I'm sticking with. All right, next up, uh, Nat King Cole, live at the Blue Note Chicago. So this is being put out by the Iconic Artists Group, which is not a label I was familiar with, have to be honest. Um, they're putting it out in a double LP format, but I believe they're also releasing it on CD for Record Store Day. And it's in a quantity of 4,000. So quite a, you know, that's, that's a large number of, uh, of copies. So what this is, is 1953 live performances. Um, it's, it's being restored from the original tapes with lacquers cut by Kevin Gray. It's pressed at RTI on 180 gram vinyl with a double LP gatefold tip on jacket by Stoughton. So that's some serious cred. Like that's the sort of stuff that they do for tone poet ed editions. And it's very possible that folks are going to see the beauty of the packaging and become enamored. But, um, but, but we'll see. And here's the thing. Nat King Cole doesn't need great packaging. He's a amazing artist in his, I mean, every album that he's done is like just phenomenal. And the fact that this is from 1953, I think is interesting because that's pretty early. So I actually think that there's a lot of reasons to, uh, to be interested in this. Audience, I'm gonna say is high because of the crossover appeal. Uh, in terms of whether it's scarce, that's a low with 4,000 copies. And is it desirable? I'm going to say high because Nat King Cole's fantastic. Kevin Gray's involved, the pressing process, the beauty of the packaging, it all comes together. And um, yeah, so so even though it's it's not scarce, it may still be a difficult one to pick up. All right, next we have, and I hope I don't butcher the name, Manu Dibango. This is Manu 76. That's the title of the album. And the uh, the label that's putting out is Soul Makosa, which is also the title of one of his albums that he put out, I think for Atlantic in the early 70s, maybe mid 70s. Um, this, is a, this is in a quantity of 1,000. Uh, so again, recorded in 1976. The lineup includes Joe Tongo, Slim Pezin, Lucien Doubt, uh, Alex Frankfurt, and Georgia Dibango. Um, so I actually think that uh, Debango's work is worthy of more attention than it gets. I think his, uh, his album, Somacosa, is really fantastic. And the first time I heard that, I was like blown away that I hadn't heard it before because it was only like a couple of years ago. I don't know that much about this uh, particular album. Um, and, and honestly, I feel like 
I just, I, I don't know how many folks are aware of his music, even though I think more people should be. So I'm going to say that the audience for this is going to be low um, in terms of whether it's scarce. Yes, absolutely. Quite high because it's just a quantity of 1000. Desirability, unfortunately, I'm going to say low, but um, that's not a, I don't wish that it was low. I think it, I think it should be higher. It's just that I think that's the, uh, the fact of the matter. All right, so here's a fun one. Bill Evans, everybody digs Bill Evans. This is being put out by Kraft Recordings. So a lot of people come to the table for Kraft. They do a fantastic job. You can typically see them at every record store day. Uh, this is in a quantity of 4,500. So I think that's the highest that we've seen yet. Um, what is this album? Well, it was originally put out by Riverside. I believe it is Bill Evans' second album as a leader, uh, put out for Riverside in 1959. And the lineup includes, well, it's a trio, so it's just Sam Jones and then Philly Joe Jones. Um, this is a mono release, and Kraft has uh, made it clear that this is, a, this is exclusive to Record Store Day, which makes me think that at some point they'll put out a stereo release, probably in another year, <laughs> but we'll see. So anyway, mono release, it is a all analog pressing lacquers cut from the original master tapes by Kevin Gray at Coherent Audio. It is pressed at RTI on 180 gram vinyl with a Stoughton jacket. So um, pretty good credentials, amazing music on this album. Um, this is so much more worthwhile than any of those lost recordings or like double LP stuff that they've put out in prior record store days for Bell Evans. This is really one to get, the music's fantastic. So audience, I think, hi, everybody loves Bill Evans, especially on record store day. Is it limited? No, not at all, but I still think it's gonna go quick because everybody's interested and desirability quite high because again, everybody loves Bill, it's Kevin Gray, it's the process, it's craft recordings. Like this is um, this is gonna be one that people are, people are gonna believe is scarce and they're gonna be snatching them up, but I have a feeling that a lot of people who want a copy who are actually standing in line on record store day are gonna be able to get one. So next is Kenny Garrett's Who Killed AI? Um, so this is a brand new release being put out by Mac Avenue Records. This is not the first Kenny Garrett Mac Avenue Records release for Record Store Day. There's been another, and actually that, that other one, I think it was like two years ago. It was really, uh, really good. Um, so this is in a quantity of just 1,500. Now, for those of you who know Kenny Garrett and you know him as a really brilliant uh, sort of saxophone player and um, probably reed player more generally, um, you will real. You need to know that this is very different. This is not. Uh, this is not what you'd expect from Kenny Garrett. This is a very electronic album. Um, so again, not what you'd expect. There is. There's a voice here. There's like looping drums. There's synthesizer. The sax kind of has an electrified sound, at least in the clip that I was able to preview. This is. Um, I would say it's experimental and it's not straight ahead jazz. And, and like I said, it's just. It, th this is Kenny Garrett like trying to take music forward. And um, I actually have to say that what I listened to sounded pretty good. I was I was pretty surprised. I didn't think I was gonna like it, but I, but I kinda did. Um, is that gonna be enough for me to pick it up? Not sure yet. So audience on this, I'm gonna say low. Um, you know, I think more people should know Kenny Garrett than, than do. Um, and he's still with us and he's still recording and uh, people can still go hear him and I think they should. Um, in terms of whether this is uh, scarce, yeah, it's quite scarce. So I'm gonna rank that high and desirability. Um, unfortunately, I'm gonna say low, but again, that's not an opinion. I'm trying to like forecast what the overall desirability is in the market for this type of release. I'm not, this, I'm not trying to make it be my opinion because actually having listened to it, I think that it's, it, I'm, I feel that this release is more desirable. And honestly, I, I, think you should, I think you should go preview it. All right, so Astrid Gilberto, and this is titled That Girl from Ipanema. This is being put out by a, a Friday Music in a quantity of just 1,000. So this is a 1977 recording, and um, it features like some interesting folks. Uh, apparently, Chet Baker and Ron Carter and Dom Um Romau is on it. Um, and let's see, aqua colored vinyl. You know, here's here's the thing: is that um, you could you could put out any album by Astrid Gilberto as long as the words you know "Girl from Ipanema" are in the title, as as they are in this. And I think people are going to come to the table for it because they're expecting it to be something very specific, which is that uh, that Stan Getz record. And um, and it's, you know, I'm sure it's not going to be that. So I guess the question is, how much does it sort of pander to that crowd? Is this a best hits type of thing? It could be. 
Um, anyway, overall, I'm going to say the audience, eh, maybe medium. People really love that title track. There is more crossover here outside of just, say, a um, straight-ahead jazz audience. In terms of its uh, scarcity, quite high with just 1,000 copies. And desirability overall, I'm just going to kind of say medium. There's not a lot of Astro Gilberto's work that's being put out. I don't know that this is necessarily going to expose something like sort of brand new about her as a singer. But um, but it, but again, I, I just think that uh, kind of a combination of uh, of things here that uh, that you know that that's still medium desirability. So Vince Guaraldi's "It Was a Short Summer, Charlie Brown." This is being put out by Lee Mendelson Film Productions, which um, going to try to take out any bias from my discussion here. But um, but I was fortunate enough to interview Sean Mendelson some months ago, or maybe almost well, maybe, yeah, maybe six or nine months ago uh, for the uh, the Thanksgiving title. Um, but anyway, this is yeah, it was a short summer, Charlie Brown. Quantity of 1,200, so this special was originally put out in 1969, and the uh, the musicians in the lineup with Vince Guaraldi include Monty Budwig, Jack Sperling, Pete Candoli, Frank Rossellino, Victor Fellman, Herb Ellis, William Hood, Peter Christ Lieb, and John Scott Trotter, I believe, is the uh, sort of the conductor. Um, so this has been restored and remastered by Vincent Hudson, and it is being put out on what they're calling Camp Green Vinyl. So, um, what to say about this? Well, the fact that it's Vince Guaraldi and Charlie Brown and that kind of like mesh really dictates what I think is going to happen in terms of how well this sells. So the audience for this is going to be quite high because you don't have to have seen the cover before in order to be immediately drawn to it if you have any type of nostalgia for Charlie Brown and that Vince Guaraldi sound. Um, and so I think, I think the audience is going to be high. This is also a pretty limited release with just 1,200 copies, um, so I'm ranking that high. And desirability, here's the thing, it's not that this particular TV specials soundtrack is what is gonna drive the desirability of this thing. I think it's a mixture of everything that I, that I just said. I think that it's gonna be high, I think that it's going to be a hard one to get because you're going to have a lot of people who aren't necessarily, they're not even going to know what they're going to get into, but they're going to want to pick it up and they're probably going to end up being um, happy with it as well. Now, I do believe that um, that there's some music cues on here and not necessarily full sort of, um, you know, extended length tracks with like, you know, sort of beginnings and ends, but it's not going to be sound effects either. You know, they're going to be like more robust things. I just don't think it's going to be like, you know, fully composed pieces. So that could play a role, but I just, I think that there's enough people with nostalgia for this uh, type of stuff and enough people wanting to hear more of it, uh, of, from uh, Vince Guaraldi that uh, it's going to be pretty desirable. Next is Youssef Latif's Atlantis Lullaby Concert from Avignon. So this is being put out by Elemental again. This is a double LP in a quantity of 1,500. Um, this is a never before heard performance from, uh, you know, well, I guess the recording was in Avignon, France. The lineup includes Kenny Barron, Bob Cunningham, and Albert Heath. So a pretty great lineup there. Uh, obviously produced by Zev Feldman, who again is uh, heavily involved. I you know, in Elemental his, is his label that he owns, and he also has Jazz Detective. Uh, what they're saying is that the audio is transferred and remastered from the original concert tapes. Um, they don't say, you know, by whom. But um, let's see what else. 180 gram includes a booklet. I think that there's a lot of people who have uh, sort of rediscovered Youssef Latif because of some of the other reissues that have been out there. And so I'm going to say audience... I almost want to say hi, but I'm thinking about like the overall audience for Record Store Day. So I'm just going to say medium. Uh, in terms of its uh, limited nature, its scarcity, I'm going to say hi, and desirability, I'm going to say hi. I think that uh, I think that folks want to hear more from Youssef Latif, even if it's in these um, kind of live concert formats. And I do think that this uh, I, I think this lineup is incredibly compelling. It's you know it's a double LP, so there's going to be a lot of content. So for for all of those reasons. All right, so Shelly Mann, Jazz from the Pacific Northwest. This is being put out by Real to Real, so we've uh, we've heard from them already. This is a double LP in a quantity of 1,500. Um, let's see, the uh, the recording dates are 1966. The lineup includes a number of folks, including Frank Strozier, uh, Conti Condoli, Ruth Price, Hampton Hawes, Monty Budwig, Russ Freeman, Stu Williamson, and Herb Geller. A lot of, uh, a lot of stellar folks on this one. So this is hand-numbered, as Reel to Reel did, uh, I think, with the, uh, the other one that I talked about. 
Uh, they're calling it a limited edition. It's a double LP. It's being transferred from the original tape reels and it's on 180 gram. Audience for this, I'm gonna say, is a little bit on the lower side because people should give Shelly Man more attention, but they don't. And um, and so I'm gonna say it's a little bit on the lower side in terms of uh, in terms of audience. I'm gonna say, or excuse me, in terms of scarcity, I'm gonna say high because it's 1500. And in terms of desirability, whether we need this or not. Um, I'm gonna say medium. I, I really think that uh, that Shelly Man really comes to the table in these, I mean, he always played great on studio sessions, but some of the energy that he brings to, to the live sessions that were put out by Contemporary, in fact, alongside some of the other musicians that are on this album, are it's just so stellar. Like he, he's, um, he was such an inspired player. He sound, always sounded fantastic. Uh, and so, yeah, and so I think I think medium, and in fact, this is one that I'm gonna be paying a little bit more attention to in terms of like, you know, is it something that I should pick up? All right, so um, this next one's a little problematic. In fact, there's two, and it's problematic because I know very little information about these two releases, but I'm gonna mention them anyway because they fall within the confines of what we typically talk about here. So I don't know how to pronounce the artist, so you'll have to forgive me. I, I believe the uh, the artist is Polish, but I, it's it looks like so it's W O J T E K. So is that Wojtek? Is that Wojtek? I'm really not sure. And then Mazaluski Quintet, and the two releases are first Spirit to All, and the second one is Live Spirit. Um, so the reason why this is problematic is because, and honestly, I can't even rate it because I know nothing about it. Um, I don't know, like, I, I think that you can find at least one of these titles on Bandcamp. The thing is, is that they're saying that they're being put out in just a quantity of 100 each and that it's like regional focus. And I, I just don't know what that means. Is this, is this exclusive to Europe and it's not going to make it to the US? How are they determining which uh, stores to put it in? Is it really only in say just a couple? I don't know the strategy. You don't often see something in just a quantity of 100. And so I didn't even really know how to rate this whatsoever. And, and I'm really not that familiar with the artist either. So I did make an effort um, and I wanted to make sure I referenced it here, but maybe somebody in the comments can, uh, can tell me a little bit more about what exactly is going on here. All right, so if you'll remember when I talked about Kenny Garrett, the fact that he's a sort of current musician, current, you know, new new album, new music kind of thing, um, we sort of have that situation here as well. So this is Christian McBride and Edgar Meyer, and the album is Who's Got the Melody, which is, uh, which is kind of funny um, because, you know, these guys are two bassists. They do both play piano on a few tracks, and so I think that's kind of, you know, alludes to who's got the melody on uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the title. So this is a double LP in a quantity of 1,500. Um, and you know, here's the thing: like audience, I, I know a lot of people know Christian McBride, and he's a very sort of decorated artist in terms of his, um, you know, awards and things, and fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, bassist. Um, in terms of the audience, though, for this particular release, I'm going to say low, and the reason is because because how many people outside of jazz really know Christian McBride? Plus, it's two bassists, and is there going to be is there going to be a lot of energy for an album with just two bassists? I, I just don't know. Uh, limited nature of this is it scarce? Yes, that's not many copies at 1,500. Desirability, unfortunately, I'm going to have to say low, and I'm not saying that it doesn't deserve to be heard. It probably does. It's just that on record store day, I don't know how many people are going to be, um, you know, really itching to uh, to grab this. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm just gonna stick with it. So Charles Mingus reincarnations. This is being put out by Candid. And the quantity is, in a, is a 3,400. This is a sequel to Incarnations, which came out last year for Record Store Day. I want to say it was the Black Friday Record Store Day, though. Um, 180 gram remastered by Bernie Grunman. Now, um, in terms of my ratings, this is really difficult for me to uh, to do without being without incorporating my bias because. Um, I personally don't think that Candid has been doing a good job. Uh, not just with these two Charles Mingus releases, but with all of their other reissues of Candid stuff. And I keep finding myself getting into, not like arguments, but other people disagree with me in thinking that, that Candid does a great job. And yet every single time I've picked up one, either there's pressing flaws, like there's noise, or it just doesn't sound good. And like right now, I just don't feel like you can charge 30 or 30 plus dollars 
if your uh, if your release doesn't sound good when you consider such a you know the stellar job right that so many other labels are doing. And so I'm not really a big fan of what Candid is doing. Um, and and I didn't hear great things about incarnations uh, from last year. So we'll see. Um, and, and like I said, it's just difficult for me to, uh, to, to comment. And this is even despite the fact that Bernie Grumman is uh, remastering it. I don't necessarily know that it's, well, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's his fault or if it's the source material. Anyway, I'm gonna say the audience regardless for this is medium because a lot of folks know Charles Mingus and, um, and you know, maybe, maybe sort of uh, attracted to this, although I, I have not heard the content myself. In terms of its uh, limited nature, its scarcity, I'm gonna say low because 3,400 is a ton of copies. Desirability, I really wanna say low, but that would be, um, that would be unfair in, in incorporating my own bias. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna have to say medium. Uh, it's just that I don't think anybody's gonna have a hard time picking this up. I also don't know how many people are gonna be like playing it more than once. Moving right along, we've got Charlie Parker, Norman Grant's Jazz at the Philharmonic. This is being put out by Verve in a pretty large quantity of 3,500. This is being put out for the 75th anniversary of the recording, originally, um, originally in 1949. The lineup includes Ray Brown, Hank Jones, Flip Phillips, Buddy Rich, and Tommy Turk. And it is, uh, let's see, mastered from the original analog sources and pressed on yellow vinyl. Um, this is uh, th this could be really good or it may not be. It really depends on how good that original recording was. And so all of the uh, JATP or Jazz at the Philharmonic releases typically have that kind of like concert hall type of vibe. Um, you'll you'll hear audience like loud thunderous audience applause and stuff after each piece. And it, um, it just really, they typically have like a very vintage sound. This is not like, you know, this isn't like um, intimate, you know, studio type of uh, recording quality plus 1949. So I don't know, that's, that's kind of what I think. But um, the audience for this, everybody knows Charlie Parker and it's gonna have some good crossover appeal. Although again, 1949, um, that I think that's going to impact the desirability. In terms of the uh, the scarcity, I'm going to say low because there's a lot of uh, titles and, and desirability. I'm, I'm just going to say medium because it is kind of that balance of everybody knows Charlie Parker, but 1949 and a lot of these JATP titles are not that scarce. They've been put out a number of times. So I don't know. I don't know that there's pent up demand for this, but at the same time, there's a lot of folks who are interested in kind of the uh, sort of the historical element of this uh, particular recording. So here's an interesting one. Dave Pike, The Doors of Perception. This is being put out by Nature Sounds. It was originally put out by Not Atlantic, but I think their subsidiary Vortex. Um, it's being put out in a quantity of 2000 and it has him playing with Eddie Daniels, Lee Connitz, Don Friedman, and Chuck Israel. So this is a weird album. It's kind of trippy. There's sound effects. There's like piped in applause. It's pretty experimental in nature. And I think that the, uh, I think it's got a great cover that kind of alludes to some of the sort of psychedelic nature of it. And I think that that may play a role in terms of uh, even folks who have never heard of this album might bring them to the table simply because of that. So it's being pressed on blue swirl vinyl. We actually don't know the source in terms of whether it was the original master tapes. Um, but uh, otherwise what, recorded in 1966, finally released in 1970. So the audience for this, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna rank as medium. Um, people probably in the jazz space know the album and they know that Dave Pike has a little bit of a percept or a uh, sort of a reputation for putting out really interesting stuff. Um, he was a vibraphonist, but somehow found himself just putting out a ton of like trippy albums and stuff that would get sampled. And he has a bunch of albums that fall into that category. So I think that there's gonna be a pretty good audience uh, coming to the table for this thing. In terms of its scarcity, I'll say medium because it's at that uh, 2000 quantity uh, mark. And in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, desirability, I'm gonna say medium as well. I may change that once I find out what the source content is on this, but because we don't know if it was sourced from the original tapes, uh, and because we don't know the, the mastering engineer, anything like that, uh, it's just kind of hard to say. Right, so Pucho and his Latin Soul Brothers and the album title, I believe, is pronounced Yaina. This is being put out by Ubiquity Records. I do believe that that combination, Pucho and his Latin Soul Brothers and Ubiquity, put a title out either for Record Store Day last year or maybe it was the April Record Store Day, but um, that, that 
comes to mind anyway. So uh, they're putting this out in a quantity of 1200. It was originally released in 1971. It was also reissued by Cubob, I think in 1996. So it hasn't been that long since a reissue, but 180 gram vinyl, tip on jacket, no other detail about the mastering. Um, I don't know, here's the thing. There's like one or two titles by Pucho and his Latin Soul Brothers that are extremely desirable and therefore very expensive to get. And a lot of that carries over to the other albums. Um, so therefore, I think there's a lot of folks who are gonna take notice of this, especially folks who, uh, who appreciate uh, jazz music. So I'm gonna say medium on audience. In terms of its scarcity, I'm gonna say high because it's a low pressing quantity. Desirability, I'm gonna say low to medium. I, I haven't quite figured that one out. I just, um, you know, it, artist is not that recognizable. I don't think people know what they're getting into when it comes to, uh, to this music, so they don't have an idea in their heads. And is that gonna be enough for them to like really want to grab one off the shelves when they see it on record store day? I, I just don't know. So here's an exciting one. Sonny Rollins, Freedom Weaver, 1959 European Tour Recordings. This is being put out by Resonance, so it's going to get a lot of attention. It is also a 4LP set in a quantity of 2,500. Um, this is previously only bootleg, uh, only available in bootleg form. The lineup includes, it really lineups, so there's Henry Grimes and then there's um, drummers that trade off including uh, Pete LaRocca, Kenny Clark, and Joe Harris. Um, so those four LPs are uh, on 180 gram vinyl and it does include a 56 page booklet. It's probably gonna be expensive, but we don't know exactly what that means yet. Could be a hundred bucks. I, I have no idea, maybe it's 80. For some reason, 80 seems more like a landing point for, for stuff on Record Store Day, but residents can do whatever the, the heck they want, right? Maybe it'll be 120. Um, so people are gonna pay attention uh, to this one. Because it's residents, because it's Sonny Rollins, 1959 is a great era for, to, to hear more content from Sonny Rollins. I'm really excited for this. I'm gonna say audience is high for all of those reasons. Limited nature, I'm gonna say medium, because 2,500, desirability, I think quite high. The only thing that's gonna impact that desirability rating is the price, I think. <laughs> all right, here's one uh, that is bizarre, bizarrely awesome. <laughs> so this is Pharaoh Sanders, Harvest Time, seven inch single. This is being put out by Luaka Bop, who recently put out um, the self-titled release box set, right? And they also put out the Floating Points title from a couple of years ago uh, in a quantity of 2,500. And again, it's a seven inch single. This is probably not gonna cost much, but that is a killer cover, sort of Japanese cover. Uh, so there's only two tracks in this. There's the Harvest Time radio edit on one side, and then there's a uh, the, the track Love Will Find A Way on the other. Um, audience for this is high. People love Pharaoh Sanders for a great reason, um, and, and he's gotten a lot of attention lately with reissues, as well as it, the unfortunate fact that, uh, that the man uh, passed away recently. Uh, in terms of its limited nature, I'll say medium because 2,500, desirability high. So one of the reasons why it's gonna be high is for some of those reasons that I mentioned about Pharaoh, but also because this is probably gonna be an inexpensive thing and it's small, it's easy to grab and just like throw in with the rest of your stuff. And that cover's fantastic. So for all of these reasons, I think it's gonna be a, a highly desirable title. Next up, Gil Scott Heron and Brian Jackson, and the title is Winter in America. This is originally put out on Strata East and I would say is probably the most easily purchased and available title on Strata East. I think it's still, I think originals still go for like, I don't know, maybe 30 to $50, something like that. In any event, the reissue is being put out by Culture Factory USA in a quantity of 4,000, so there's a lot of them. Um, they are including an OB strip, which is a little curious on this, uh, probably similar to the original Japanese release. It's gonna be in a gatefold jacket. It is a color vinyl edition, which is sort of a marbled white and black kind of donut kind of thing. It actually looks pretty cool. Um, I don't know the source in terms of whether they uh, have the original tapes or not, but um, a lot of folks know Gil Scott Heron. Um, his uh, you know impact not in squarely jazz music, but poetry and rap. And so there's, there's good crossover appeal in this thing. Um, limited, gonna say low because 4,000, I mean, this is one of the most available jazz titles or again, jazz adjacent, right? Um, so, so I'm gonna say low there, and desirability, I'm gonna say high. Uh, I think a lot of people are gonna be into this. 
it, you know, it's not to say that that original pressing isn't available. It's just that, you know, there's something, uh, something sort of sexy about being able to get the newest one on record store day. So I think a lot of folks are going to be interested in picking this up. All right, so the next one, or really next two, they're both Sun Ra titles. This is a tough one for me to keep my bias out because I'm not really a Sun Ra fan. Don't own more than like two of his records and they're, they're like early ones. So uh, the first title is Pink Elephants on Parade. This is being put out by Modern Harmonic. So interestingly, these two titles are not paired, like they're not being put out by the same uh, by the same label. So it may be coincidental that they're both coming out. So this title, Pink Elephants on Parade, is in a quantity of 1800. It is apparently previously unheard, pressed on pink vinyl, and it's Sun Ra playing Disney songs. I have, n that just sounds the, like the most bizarre thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens, I suppose. I think, I still think the audience for this is going to be pretty low. I don't know that there's that many people who are non-jazz people who are buying Sun Ra stuff. And there's also been a lot of reissues of his stuff. And the, the condition and sort of audio quality has really been wide ranging. So you really don't know what to expect. Um, and I hadn't heard of Modern Harmonic, I gotta be honest. So I'm gonna say low on audience. I'm gonna say high on uh, scarcity, because that's, that's a low number. But desirability, I'm gonna say low. I, I don't know how many people, even Sun Ra fans, no, they'll wanna hear Dis him play Disney songs, I suppose, but, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not interested. Um, all right, so, so the next one is uh, Sun Ra at the Showcase, live in Chicago, 1976 to 1977. This is being put out by Zev Feldman's Jazz Detective label, double LP, quantity of 3,000 unreleased live sessions from that time period, transferred from the original tape reels, 180 gram. Like I said, double LP comes with photos and stuff. Um, so... I actually think that this is a little bit of a different story than the previous one, both because it's uh, Zev Feldman's Jazz Detective label, as well as the time period, I think, and the fact that it's not Disney songs. Um, audience, I'm going to say low to medium. I still don't know how many people are, are itching to buy some of these um, sort of previously unheard Sun Ross stuff. I just, I don't really know. In terms of its limited nature, medium, 3000s, a lot of titles and desirability, I'm gonna say medium. I just think that this is a, uh, this, this just has the hallmarks of a little bit better of a buy than the other one. So don't worry, we're almost there at the end. <laughs> so this next one, Art Tatum, Jewels in the Treasure Box, the 1953 Chicago Blue Note Jazz Club Recordings Deluxe Edition. This is a triple LP in a quantity of 2000 and the music is previously unissued, live performances, again, 1953. Lineup includes Everett Barksdale and Slam Stewart, which is a pretty great lineup uh, with uh, Art Tatum. Um, so the material is transferred from the original tape reels. It is mastered for LP by Matthew Luttons. Again, we've heard from him in the, uh, in the past. I'm probably pronouncing his last name incorrectly. I apologize. This is three hours of content though. So again, triple LP, three hours of content, all 180 gram. Um, I really like Art Tatum. Uh, I've been listening to more of his stuff lately on Verve, and I just get a lot of energy from his playing, especially if he's uh, in, in a trio format, which he is here, and so I think that's encouraging. But at the same time, I think this is a little early, and he's not quite the same name as, say, a you know Thelonious Monk or, or somebody else who, who they might have been able to you know put together a, a sort of a triple LP on. So I'm going to say the audience overall for this is low. I don't think there's a lot of crossover appeal here. Um, the uh, sort of scarcity, I'm going to say medium because a uh, quantity of 2,000. Um, and then, and then I'm going to say <sighs> desirability. This is tough. Like, I, I think that this is going to be put together well. I'm personally interested in it. I don't know how many folks outside of the jazz space will be, but do we need this? I kind of think that we do. Like, I think that we need as much Art Tatum as we can get, and I think that there could be a lot of, like, really interesting playing here in this live format, you know, as opposed to some of the more traditional studio sessions. Um, kind of, a, you know, maybe a little bit of a product of, like, how how out of it was he? He was famous for playing, um, for just drinking a lot, uh, but still being able to play just amazing, amazing music. And so there may be some, I don't know, we'll, we'll have to see how uh, how variable his playing is on this, but I'm gonna say desirability is medium. And this honestly is one that I'm, that I'm kind of interested in. All right, two more. This next one is Jazz Dispensary, 
Uh, everybody knows Jazz Dispensary these days. Their, uh, their Instagram following is like ridiculous. It's like hundreds of thousands of people. Um, the title is Freedom Sound, The People Arise. So Jazz Dispensary is a subsidiary of Kraft Recordings who does a fantastic job in almost every scenario, if not every. Um, the quantity on this thing is 4,000 and it's a compilation of songs. So people who remember previous record store days know that Jazz Dispensary puts out a new volume each time and it's always a compilation of music that's typically from labels like Milestone and Prestige and others. And, um, and so that's what they're doing here. So here we have songs by Joe Henderson, Gary Bartz, Rand Blake, Azar, Azar Lawrence, and AK Salim, among others. It's being pressed on blue swirl vinyl. Typically they do like a die cut cover. We'll have to see. It's hard to tell with the, uh, the, the photo. I'm gonna say audience on this is high. Jazz Dispensary is really creating a community of people who will buy every title regardless of what it is. So I think there's gonna be a lot of interest in this. Uh, it's great packaging as well. Limited nature on this is low because, uh, so low scarcity because there's 4,000 copies and desirability I'm gonna say high, like for all the reasons that I've already said. It's the lineup, it's the, it's the fact that it's Jazz Dispensary, um, sort of the accompanying recording quality of uh, Kraft Recordings releases. Um, so yeah, this, this could be a tough one to get, but at the same time, everybody who wants one on Record Store Day, probably gonna be able to grab it. And lastly, we have Mal Waldron and Steve Lacey, and the title is The Mighty Warrior Live at Antwerp and this is being put out by Elemental Music. So double LP in a quantity of 1,500, so not many. Um, this is, I guess, unreleased stuff. It is being transferred from the original tapes. The session is from 1995, so it's relatively modern. I hesitate to say that at this point, though, because like 1995 is almost 30 years ago. But um, so so let's uh, so let's so let's see. Um, Reggie Workman and Andrew Surreal are in the lineup, and I think that's a great lineup with Mal and uh, Steve Lacey. Um, so where would I put this? This is a little bit tough because there's a lot of folks out there for for this lineup. I mean, this is just an incredible lineup actually to have these four musicians, but we have to remember that this is later in their careers. And so um, the fact that it was unreleased, if it was like, if this was like, you know, a 1970 session, I think we'd be talking about uh, something very different. But in any event, audience, I'm gonna say medium because I think that the jazz community will show up for it, but not necessarily others. Um, limited nature of this is a scarce. Yes, it's quite, it's gonna be quite scarce with just 1500. It's possible that not every store is gonna get one. And desirability, um, I'm gonna have to say hi, and I think it's for, it's for that lineup, right? And the fact that it's elemental because, um, because again, they carry their own fan base along with them too. All right, those of you who have stuck with me, good for you. Um, for those of you who skipped ahead in the uh, chapters, um, that's fine too. So what I wanted to close with is 10 titles, actually eight of them that I think are gonna be the you know, combination of my composite scores that are gonna be the hardest ones to get on Record Store Day. So again, if just as a reminder, I, I ranked for audience, scarcity, and desirability, and I assigned numbered ratings to each of them, and I weighted them equally. So the eight that are gonna be hardest to get is what I'm gonna start with, and then I'm gonna give you two others that I think are just some of the highlights as well, but it'll be a little bit easier to get. So those eight are the Vince Guaraldi, Charlie Brown title, Cannonball's two titles, Burnin' in Bordeaux as well as Poppin' in Paris. I think the Chet Baker and Jack Sheldon one is gonna be difficult. Youssef Latif, the Sonny Rollins box set, again, that price will dictate just how difficult it is. Uh, the Pharaoh Sanders seven inch single, and then the Mal Waldron Steve Lacey title. So according to my very unscientific method, those are gonna be the hardest ones to actually find on Record Store Day because of that mix of how many people are after them, the scarcity of the title, and how desirable is it. So um, two more honorable mentions that had a very low on the scarcity rating, but very high on audience and desirability are Nat King Cole and of course, Bill Evans. So I think that, um, I think that those are gonna be two highlights of the, uh, of the entire list and, um, and are gonna be fantastic and are just gonna be very worthwhile to get as well. As always, thanks very much for sticking with me. Um, let me know what you thought about this in the comments, if you disagree with what I said about some of these titles, and also let me know if uh, you thought I should have included something in my discussion that maybe I didn't, maybe I forgot something. Sometimes I do. In any event, um, I'm looking forward to Record Store Day, and I hope everyone else is as well. I think there's some solid titles here, and um, we'll just see what happens on the day. But uh, thanks very much, and I'll see you next time.